Taylor Swift is a fascist. She's a, a fascist. What? What am I? Fascist. What? Did fascist. Say Taylor Swift. Swift. What? She's what? Going. what am I even saying? Where? What's going on with her? Where am I? X. I need to find the grass. White, White, White women. The girls. Grass. Need to grass. touch grass. grass. Need to grass. I need to touch grass. Nah, I'm just kidding. Taylor Swift. She has taken over the popular consciousness an amazing 17 years after her initial debut album. Find her fingers delicately placed on the pulse of the postmodern, post-pandemic, post-truth moment and right up the ass of white America. The era's tour single-handedly stimulated the economy to the tune of perhaps $10 billion. The FBI made Canva graphics with references to Speak Now, heads of state are in her DMs with nuclear codes, and meanwhile, she's managed to maintain one of the most powerful fandoms whose cultish grip on the young mirrors that of your favorite 20th century Marxist-Leninist. Update on my dad. To those who've been asking, thanks for caring first and foremost. My mom is trying to meddle in and fix things between us, but I genuinely can't stomach somebody hating on Taylor. I, I just can't. Even if you remotely dislike her, it's the worst type of betrayal to me. She found out I dumped his heart medicine in the trash can, which granted, he's done way worse by throwing my vinyls and Evermore dress in the trash as well. Taylor's the reason I exist. She's my blood and my soul and everything good in my life. She's the person I think about every day and it's not a weird parasocial thing. She's just my hero in every way possible. She's the reason I am who I am today. And if you can't respect that, then- One tweet from her and your local liberal democracy is done. And you know what? I'm on board. Screw you, Jesus fan, if it's no longer the year 2023. Time started on December 13th, 1989. But why Swift? Why now? Why do we care so much about Taylor Swift? Taylor Swift has been making headlines her entire career, but the Twitter discourse about her is in shambles. I can never tell fact from fiction. It's not just a Taylor Swift problem, though. In the clickbait hell that is the 2020s, it's near impossible for us to trust anything on our Instagram feed or Twitter timeline. How am I supposed to be an informed, responsible citizen when there's so many different news sources and outlets? Maybe I should just give up and get radicalized on Facebook. No, never give up hope, because this video video is sponsored by Ground News. Ground News is a website and app that allows you to compare how stories are covered by thousands of news websites to get a full picture of what's actually happening. As a relevant example, the other day I heard a lot of discussion about some tragic events at a Taylor Swift concert in Brazil, and during moments like these it's really easy for rumors and misinformation to spread on social media. But on Ground News I can easily find the story and see that there are more than 200 sources reporting on it and also see that a majority of them are left or center leaning. If I scroll down, I can compare headlines and quickly get to the facts of what happened. I can also see how different sides report on those facts. Left and right leading sources tend to focus on Taylor Swift's reaction, saying she is devastated, while center sources point out high temperatures and lack of water as the main issue. This is a fast and easy way to separate fact from fiction and not get caught up in the stress of echo chamber overload. One of my favorite features is the For You page, where I can search for topics I'm interested in, like LGBTQ plus issues or trans news, and monitor media bias with regard to the communities that I care about. And using the blind spot feed, I can monitor which stories are underreported by the left and right. Not only does this help me get more informed about the stories that I care about, but observing the ways different political sides cover news stories really helps me understand how to have conversations with those who might disagree with my perspective. You can subscribe to the Ground News Pro Plan for less than $1 a month by using my link, ground.news slash Alexander Avila. You can get 30% off their Vantage Plan, the one I use, which includes unlimited access to important features such as the blind spot feed for about $5 a month. If you want to support my channel and improve the way you engage with the news, head to ground.news slash Alexander Avila for this special deal. Well. That was important, and I have the gall to focus on Taylor Swift in the current year? Who cares? I was like you once, and then the world hit me in the face. Cold. Hard. And then it hit me again. Ouch. 
<laughs> she's already in us. She's in our DNA, in the very atoms that make up our reality. But she also represents the way we've learned to understand cultural moments, and perhaps ourselves. So, let's go through the narrative of Taylor Swift's life, and the narrative of the Swift narratives. In the end, we might end up making our own narrative out of the narrative of the narrative. Man, I need to get a job. In all of this, my point is not to say that Swift is the best or deserving of the most praise and recognition. Instead, I want to highlight how Swift's career narrative exemplifies something about the way we live our lives in the digital pop culture age for better or worse. To get to the bottom of this queen of bottoms over the past two months, I've fallen down the rabbit hole of Swift's discography, read an immoral amount of cultural theory, and collected qualitative data from over 1,000 people, all in the service of figuring out the true meaning of Taylor Swift's cultural presence. And not once did I use the quadratic formula. Fuck algebra. So in contemporary Western culture, we have a rather romantic image of what constitutes a great artist. The artist is an individual tortured dude person who lives in a box and scavenges the depths of their genius inner soul to offer the world something beautiful and homoerotic. But we take this image for granted. We assume that throughout time, art has always been about expressing yourself. Art is feeling. Art is individual and personal. Whatever. It's a cute idea. I like it. I've dipped my Patreon exclusive toes in self-expression, but the way we understand artistic expression in the contemporary world is also a social construct. I'm sorry, stop, I'm sorry. Back in 17th and 18th century Europe, art, music especially, wasn't about authenticity or expressing yourself. It was about degenerate twinks taking commissions from rich sugar daddies. Mozart, Beethoven, cucks for the elites. This was called patronage. Rich people give money to artists, and artists make art that please rich guy. But then some social poop soup brewed around the 19th century. Some obscure alternative fringe movement called capitalism changed everything. Suddenly, kings and inbred aristocrats were no longer what sociologists like to call the shit. Hierarchy in the new social system was all about capital. People who owned companies, investors, masses of consumers, art and music no longer served the function of appealing to aristocratic institutions, but a market. In the words of Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm, the real problem was that of the artist cut off from a recognizable function, patron or public, and left to cast his soul as a commodity upon a blind market, to be bought or not, or to work within a system of patronage which would generally have been economically untenable even if the French Revolution had not established its human indignity. The artist, therefore, stood alone, shouting into the night, uncertain even of an echo, it was only natural that he should turn himself into the genius, who created only what was within him, regardless of the world and in defiance of a public whose only right was to accept him on his own terms or not at all. The cultural construct of artistic genius became a cope, a way for artists to understand and market themselves in a new era. And to this day, we retain a similar individualistic view of art. And you know what? There are parts of it that are fine. I like expressing my feelings, clearly. But I'm not going to pretend like the capitalist way of doing art, the way of arting that I've coincidentally been brought up to believe is somehow superior to everything else. If I lived in early or pre-modern Europe and somehow hadn't been burned at the stake, I might have been giving some elaborate argument about how art is all about keeping the moral fabric together or about praising God. Maybe there's something universal about the concept of art, but the concept of marketing your individual genius? Nah, that's the market, baby. Our souls are commodities. But hey, small price to pay for the ability to get this candy shipped to my house in five hours. Hell yeah. Since I was 15 years old, if people criticized me for something, I changed it. So you realize you might be this amalgamation of criticisms that were hurled at you, and not an actual person who's made any of these choices themselves. I don't know Taylor Swift. 
I don't know how she takes her coffee. I don't know the last time she's cried. I don't know her take on the state's monopoly of violence. I don't know her. That being said, she has spent the last 20 years selling the culture, a persona that has objectively affected our lives in ways that are worth talking about. Now, I wanted to keep this analysis as non-parasocial as possible, but it's important to note. Taylor Swift has never been secretive about the ways her personal life directly informs her art, so why wouldn't I discuss the public choices and comments she's made as a part of the story of her cultural impact? That being said, I'm not going to talk about Taylor Swift as if I know her character or intentions. Instead, I'm going to analyze the story of her public life as a cultural narrative in the making. A text that can be read and put in its proper context. Even so, it is a narrative that involves a living person, and I want to respect that as much as possible. Throughout all of this, keep in mind that the point of this video isn't to say that Taylor Swift is inherently more valuable than other artists. Rather, I'm here to discuss, in typical flamboyant fashion, two things. Number one, how her career has uniquely and irrevocably impacted the 21st century. And number two, how her career epitomizes important aspects of 21st century existence. And with that, our story starts in 1989. Taylor Allison Swift was born to two finance bros, Scott Kingsley Swift, former stockbroker at Merrill Lynch, and Andrea Gardner Swift, previously a marketing manager at a mutual fund. The young Taylor Swift grew up in an impressive five-acre home in suburban Pennsylvania. But for all of these connections and support systems, one thing mattered the most. There were people invested in her future. Even her name carries that fact. My mom named me Taylor because she thought I would probably end up in corporate business. Both my parents are finance people, and she didn't want any kind of executive, boss, manager to see if I was a girl or a boy if they got my resume. And her parents knew how to invest well. Communications researcher Miriam Rahali highlighted this naming moment in Swift's origin story as particularly important. From an early age, Taylor was constructed as an ideal neoliberal constituent and produced as a brand, which involved creating a detachable, saleable image and narrative that could then be distributed within the cultural marketplace. Taylor Swift hadn't even been born yet. She hadn't even been given a name, and her parents were already preparing Swift's public image for corporate success. But Taylor Swift ended up being a theater kid. From a young age, she and her parents regularly traveled to New York City for vocal and acting lessons. At some point, while falling in love with music and performance, the young Swift became a country fanatic. Not exactly all the rage in suburban Pennsylvania. Everybody else was gangsters. And though I could say a thousand words about Swift having all this privilege, and I will, as a kid, she experienced a cloud of insecurity and exclusion. I remember, uh... You know, when I went through this period of time when I didn't really have that many friends at school, people, kids would just heckle me and, and be like, oh, go sing that country beep. At that point, it just dawned on me that I had to love being different or else I was just going to end up being dark and angry. That experience became a fundamental part of her songwriting. Still, you still see that in her music today. Yeah. That there's that sort of underlying, um, a little bit of insecurity that is still there. It will, ne it will never go away. And she was formed by it, in a way. Absolutely. It gave her the very first songs that she wrote. Tale as old as time. An initial childhood alienation fuels an insecurity that drives a primordial urge to purge all feelings of inadequacy through the sweet poison of outsider praise. Capitalism is hella good at turning that into soul-destroying success. Let me demonstrate this through an illustrative humble brag. I went to an Ivy League school, and I can tell you that the 1% of tomorrow consists of two groups, trust fund kids and neurotic people pleasers. But Taylor Swift somehow managed to be both, and that is frightening for everyone involved, except for the people who stand to profit. I've been trained to be happy when 
you get a lot of praise. At age 11, Taylor Swift saw an episode of Behind the Music, where famous country musician Faith Hill spoke about getting her start in Nashville, Tennessee. Ever since I saw that, that TV program, I was obsessively, obnoxiously bugging my parents every day. Just, we gotta go to Nashville. Um, can we go to Nashville? And so they just went. I guess. Until finally, we planned a trip to Nashville. Sounds about white. During a spring break trip to Nashville with her family, 11-year-old Taylor Swift walked up and down Nashville's music district, handing out CDs of her singing to any office she could find. Apparently that's not how it works, and after her dreams didn't instantly come true, she went back home and Taylor Swift decided that if she wanted the music industry's attention, she had to become a great songwriter. So she did. From ages 12 to 13, Taylor traveled to Nashville about every two months to meet songwriters, network, and work open mics. During one of these gigs, she got the attention of RCA Records. With them, she scored a developmental deal, which basically means that the record company promised to help her develop as a musician, work on her image, pay the Illuminati membership fee, and overall set her up for a career as a recording artist. To make it work, her parents moved their entire lives to Nashville. And I want you to really think about that. Not only did Taylor Swift have a safety net as a white upper-class child, but a family willing to upend their entire lives for her career. After a year working with RCA, Taylor decided that they failed the vibe check, so Swift decided to look for a better deal. Eventually, that deal came when she was 15 years old. She signed to Big Machine Records, a new record label started by former Universal Music Group Big Shot, Scott Borchetta. In fact, she was the first person that Scott signed with Big Machine Records. I signed Taylor Swift to Big Machine Records because I had to. And, uh... He wasn't really lying, because Taylor Swift's dad had a 3% stake in the record label. But hey, it wasn't just the extra $120,000 her father had lying around his pocket change that got her to where she was. She was a genuinely talented songwriter with incredible potential, and soon enough, it paid off. Just another picture to buy. Now, a year later, Music Row agrees. Her first record comes out in a few months. She'll tour and start the career she says she's been working for her entire life. All 15 years of it. Taylor Swift's self-titled debut album hit the shelves with its immediately dated graphic design on October 24th, 2006. It wasn't a big hit at first, but soon that Illuminati membership fee worked its magic as the sales slowly climbed over the course of the next year. The album, Taylor Swift, rose from number 19 on the Billboard charts to number 8. Now, I know what you're thinking. What the hell is neoliberalism? Hey, hey. Don't be scared, I'll, I'll protect you. Neoliberalism is a 20th century political and economic trend. Its definition can be a little bit nebulous since leftists use the word as a substitute for calling someone a poopy butthead, but it does in fact mean something. Simply defined, neoliberals are smelly pee holes who believe that the best society is a capitalist free market with a constitutional democracy. Some neoliberals support limited welfare and social safety nets to mitigate the inequalities caused by capitalism. The more pea-smelling neoliberals believe that governments should mostly cut welfare and let the free market take over. Neoliberal philosophy underlies the policies of Western capitalist countries in the United States and describes a general belief in capitalism and constitutional democracy that links both Democrats and Republicans. But it first emerged in the 20th century, where people like Ronald Reagan advocated for small government, tax cuts, free markets, and literal evil. Reagan-type neoliberalism is pretty influential today and helps explain why the United States, compared to other Western countries, tends to have less 
government-subsidized social programs like healthcare or education. According to free market-loving neoliberals, if the economy does well and rich people get richer, then all that wealth and prosperity will surely trickle down, because there's certainly historical precedent for that. Though neoliberalism is complex, involves a bunch of different actors, contradictory moments, and various policies, neoliberalism requires a bit of an ideological element to keep it kicking. Because when you create a free market society, there's always going to be inequality. A free market always has winners at the top and a big swath of losers at the bottom. That's us. Now add democracy into that. If most people aren't gonna hit it big in the free market, then how do you get the voting public to keep on chugging along and voting for the right neoliberals? Well, then you better convince the voting public that the free market actually works in their favor. Because if your population isn't bought into the system, then you may be in for a fat dose of social unrest. So how do you get the public to believe in a free market? A fatter dose of ideology should do the trick. Create cultural narratives like the American dream or individual freedom. Tell people that they're the main character and that if they work hard enough, anything is possible. As long as people believe in meritocracy, as long as they believe that all hard work will pay off with success, then it's super easy for them to ignore the economic and social barriers that prevent them from moving to Nashville to grow their successful songwriting career. Neoliberal ideology feels good to believe you know, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, purple, as long as you work hard, you can make it. And while that feels nice on paper, that same narrative allows for people at the top to profit from structural inequalities. After all, if you convince a society that all our problems are caused by individual failings, then they're less likely to vote or work for the structural changes that might improve life for the losers. As famous sociologist with this French name I sure hope to pronounce one day states, neoliberalism requires the trope of individual responsibility as motivating discourse and cultural glue that pastes these various components of state activity together. Taylor Swift is a part of that glue. I won't deny that she worked her ass off to get her big break. She's an excellent songwriter. Not every kid with a rich family and a dream achieves massive success, but her massive success also required a neoliberal illusion, that she was an underdog teen girl just like you who came from nowhere and worked her way to the top. A perfect neoliberal ideal. But the neoliberal version doesn't get at the fact that, hey, Swift's parents were pretty rich. They moved to Nashville to support her career. Her father invested in the record company that signed her. She's also low-key white. Not everything was handed to Taylor Swift. And yeah, she's definitely faced the ways that patriarchy undermines women's aspirations. I mean, her name is a goddamn testament to that. But there were crucial moments in which certain systems of power, influential networks, all worked in tandem to materialize her talent into success. And with that... She'll spend the rest of her career intelligently building and wrestling with the perception of her as a good, hardworking American girl. I ran a series of virtual focus groups or group interviews on Taylor Swift's cultural meanings. One person from the group interviews I conducted echoed a common perception of Swift's public image. She is very much like this capitalist queen. This like, dare I say, white supremacist image of what? especially in her early career, what a good American girl was supposed to look like. In 2012, researcher Adrienne Brown linked the success of Taylor Swift's persona with gendered expectations of what proper femininity is supposed to look like. Brown analyzed posts written by young girls on Taylor Swift fan forums in the early 2010s, and well, it's certainly something. Yes, she is a role model. Not to sound like a soundbite here, but she isn't whoring herself out like a lot of other girls we see. She's got an image based around being a good girl and still being fun. I think that's good for girls to look up to. At the same time that Taylor Swift represents this sort of hardworking teen girl neoliberal ideal, she's also highly relatable. If Taylor's songs weren't genuine, then it wouldn't be nearly as special to me. That's one of the main reasons I love her. She gets what girls specifically are going through. And that's where part of the magic lies. 
Taylor Swift manages to be a type of ideal, an image to strive for, but she's also deeply flawed, relatable, and authentic. She embodies the neoliberal ideal while giving it an emotional texture. And this personal but idealistic persona in tandem with the material privilege that accompanies her name boosts her to international stardom. What I've always wanted to do, and my main goal above everything else, is to beat what I've done before. Um, to me, that's the most important thing. And always topping what you did last. Taylor Swift released her second studio album, Fearless, in November of 2008. Another entry in her catalog of relatable teen songwriting, and probably the album that introduced most of us to Taylor Swift and her catchy melodies. She's not like other girls, but she's just like you. At the cusp of the digital age, Taylor Swift's Fearless era warmed up a generation to her teen relatability. Fearless feels like the peak of the initial authentic and pure image that Swift cultivated around her debut. And a fascinating example of the, dare I say, dialectical relationship between authenticity and social normativity that Swift masterfully plays with through her entire career. Her authenticity masks the fact that she's intentionally capitalizing off a universal normative image of teen white girl purity. Her image takes advantage of the fact that whiteness and patriarchal girlhood are assumed to be normal or standard. Taylor Swift seemed so authentic to young girls because she's conforming to an image young women internalize from a young age. All that was okay to write about because if I was feeling it, I guess it didn't occur to me that a lot of other people might be feeling it too. It's easy to fall into the traps of sexist stereotypes by painting Taylor Swift's marketing genius as manipulative or shameful. That's no reason to downplay it either. She's a mastermind, a genius in marketing a persona, and she wants you to know that. I'm sick and tired of having to pretend like I don't mastermind my own business. But I've also tried very hard, and this is one thing I regret, to convince people that I wasn't the one holding the puppet strings of my marketing existence. Or the fact that I sit in a conference room several times a week and come up with these ideas. She was raised from the beginning to be a brand. And she excelled at it. I'm in business meetings every single day talking about those things, talking about, you know, where we're selling more, where we're selling less, which are our best markets, which are our best accounts. But when I say that she excelled at marketing herself and the business around her persona, that's to say that she excels at an effed up capitalist music industry very much integrated into larger hegemonic systems of racism, patriarchy, and other man-made horrors beyond our comprehension. It's similar to the ways video essayists quote academics to leverage the historical legitimacy of academia to validate their opinions. However, the capitalist marketing strategy that underpins this image of ordinariness is also made invisible. Swift's supposedly authentic image validates the fantasy that Taylor is the subject of her songs in a completely genuine way, that she experiences what normal teens do and that everyone can relate to her, regardless of their gender, race, social class, or sexuality. Her image produces the normative expectation that there is a universal experience of adolescent girlhood, love, and romance. Swift's positioning as an authentic American girl subject is wholly tied to her status as a white, middle-class, heterosexual, normatively feminine girl. Characteristics that are repeatedly shored up through the lyrical and visual elements of her music and music videos through fans' insistence that she is a good girl whose infallibility makes her a good role model for young girls. A lot of 15-year-olds, especially low-income kids of color, have to grow up pretty quickly. They may live in rough neighborhoods, they might not have time to hang out with friends because they had to watch their siblings. They might have to take a job to supplement their family's income. The experience of love and fantasy that Taylor offers will never speak to these experiences, and I don't expect it to. But it makes you wonder if Taylor Swift is hailed as an artist that speaks to universal teen experience. If she's held up as a teen cultural representative, then what does that say about a society in which our cultural representatives only 
truly represent certain privileged groups. And though Swift will never capture the particularity of marginalized experience, you have to give her credit that she's really good at capturing her experience in a way that brings it to life. And because humans theoretically have empathy, these real experiences become relatable through their vulnerability, through our ability to project our desires and longings, even if we never had a typical teen experience. It's honest, it's genuine. Even if we've never had someone tell us that they love us at 15, the song manages to capture a simple naivete that gave us happiness at the same time that it made us vulnerable to heartbreak. And as much as we can analyze all the institutions and oppressions that make Taylor Swift possible, it would be dishonest to dismiss her art as the embodiment of capitalism or whatever. I don't need a master's degree in critical theory to understand that she put crack in the bridge of all too well. Because art isn't something we just analyze and pick apart and put in a proper context. It makes us feel. It gives us hope. It breaks us. So no, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like Taylor Swift's art shouldn't be loved. But again, Swift is more than just her art. She's been pulling at the puppet strings from the beginning. As she said, from business decisions to animated projections to chord progressions, this 19 year old is in charge of every aspect of her tour. In the early 2000s, she intelligently hopped on the social media trend early on in the game, setting the standard for the parasocial fan interactions that would come to define online fandom in the 2010s and now. Back in 2003, a new social media site called MySpace reared its crusty head to the teen millennials of the Western world and took them by storm. It was like Facebook before old people ruined it with anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. You could make your own profile, customize it, post videos, and blog. It was a useful little website for people like Taylor Swift. As an up-and-coming millennial, she saw the unique potential of MySpace for its ability to connect with fans and spread her music. It was this initial boost through viral internet marketing that helped to launch her early career. As her former manager writes, MySpace allowed us to tell the story about Taylor, and it really is her space. She wrote her bio, writes her blogs, and if someone gets commented back to, it's from Taylor. A lot of times you can tell it's somebody else hired to sit there at a computer. Taylor's space is her space. That's our secret. Social media was a new way to reach a lot of people and reach them intimately. It was huge in helping craft a relatable, down-to-earth persona. Not only did she pioneer the ways celebrities would use social media, but the ways that millennials, especially women, use the online space to craft new digital identities. This ideal subject is most apparent in the digital age, in which a particular persona, one that is highly visible, entrepreneurial, and self-configured for consumption, is not only idealized, but also rewarded. In the online era, women gained an opportunity to carve a space for their individual selves through the development and cultivation of a personal brand. This environment creates the conditions for the millennial woman to be successful by means of commodifying and selling herself. We take for granted the ways we sell pieces of ourselves to an online social market. I'm doing it right now. But Taylor Swift helped put that into motion. That's how it is today, you know? It's not like you can just make movies and sing songs and people aren't going to want to know, like, who you're dating and, and where you're eating. While Swift masterminded the construction of idealized neoliberal teen girl subjects to great profit, that also came with a price. Sure, female neoliberalism might bring in cash from a young teen audience, but a patriarchal society will always find ways to deny successful women full recognition, especially if they have young female fans. People constantly undermined Swift's abilities, even as she clearly excelled at songwriting and business. I've been a teenage girl in Nashville in the studio with people who don't listen, and I like it a lot better when they do listen to me. She was sick of being undermined for her age and gender. She got tired of people downplaying her accomplishments. But the tragedy in one of the great 
Swiftian contradictions is that from the beginning, she measured her self-worth and self-actualization through the approval of others. She built a career by excelling as a cultural representative. She built a self-identity out of this culture and made it a source of not only profit, but self-esteem. That's tough when culture is so fickle. But when you're living for the approval of strangers, and that is where you derive all of your joy and fulfillment, one bad thing can cause everything to crumble. One bad thing did end up following her throughout her career. Moon Man for best female video goes to Taylor Swift. All right, so picture this. You're Taylor Swift, 19 years old, 2009 VMAs. Your second album topped the charts, reaping top 10 hits played all over the radio. You're suddenly propelled to international stardom after music industry professionals had been telling you for years that country music didn't have a young female demographic. Along the way, people undermined your songwriting, your talent, your ambition. You haven't even lived two decades, yet have spent 90% of your life working towards a moment just like this, when you could finally prove everyone wrong, all the people in school who didn't believe, all the sexist stereotypes, all the insecurities that plagued you for a lifetime, and now the industry is at your fingertips. The future is wide open for Taylor Swift. Yo, Taylor, I I'm really happy for you. I'm gonna let you finish. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. One of the best videos of all time. And then someone takes that moment away from you. A man you respected. A man. Now let's ignore the fact that Kanye was low-key right. He was a man who felt like he had the right to interfere with another woman's narrative. And while Swift was a mastermind in controlling a good portion of the narrative she told about herself, patriarchy always finds ways to overwrite women's narratives. Taylor Swift wanted legitimacy, recognition, and respect as a songwriter, but she didn't want to earn that legitimacy by learning how to dominate the music scene like a man. She didn't want to change who she was just to get the recognition of the powerful men around her. She wanted to bring further legitimacy to the female perspective she had been crafting in her music. And part of that sure is a feminist act, Giving women control over their own narrative subverts the ways men have historically controlled cultural texts. But part of her was embedded in the same patriarchal and racist institutions that created her. Capitalist dudes got you down? Become a capitalist queen. I've had several upheavals in my career. When I was 18, they were like, she doesn't really write those songs. So my third album, I wrote by myself as a reaction to that. Speak Now is one of Taylor Swift's most lyrically and musically mature earlier records. Its themes are less fantastical and idealistic than her first two albums, showing a growing reflectiveness on love and life. For example, the song Dear John is not only catchy as hell, but it's about her toxic relationship with the famous singer-songwriter John Mayer. The song rightly calls out how normalized it is for older, powerful men to take advantage and manipulate young women. It's a moment that shows a mature vulnerability that powerfully reclaims a narrative that patriarchy hides and normalizes. John Mayer's response to the song was indicative of a pervasive attitude that formed against Swift throughout her career. I will say as a songwriter that I think it's kind of cheap songwriting. I know she's the biggest thing in the world and I'm not trying to sink anybody's ship, but I think it's abusing your talent to rub your hands together and go, wait till he gets a load of this. That's bullshit. An artist using their life experience to make art? What the f I used to think that if you leave out details that people could relate more, but I, I don't think that's the case because I think that it's, Really, the more you let people in, the more they feel let in, and the more they feel like we all share something. And yeah, I get it. It's personal. It has his name in it. But I don't know. Maybe he shouldn't have been a toxic asshole. I mean, what else should we expect from a man who, 
and this is true, said that he had a white supremacist dick and then compared it to the Grand Wizard of the KKK. He was 32 at the time, by the way. But that's not the point. Mayer dismissing Swift's songwriting exemplifies the way that the media also constantly undermined her work and reduced Swift's art to a sexist stereotype. She dated a normal amount of dudes Yet she was labeled a serial dater. And even then, who cares? Men write about their love lives all the time and no one scrutinizes their dating history. Yet when Swift wrote about her love life, the media claimed that she used her songwriting as a weapon. And instead of focusing on her successes, her real craft as a songwriter, she was reduced to a caricature of female manipulation, which just sucks because there's good reasons to criticize Taylor Swift, or at least the persona that she projects. She represents and sustains a particular brand of white femininity. She embodies girl boss capitalism and, you know, I don't really care for the production on her earlier work. But women aren't criticized and evaluated the same way that men are. No matter how powerful, no matter how Yas Queen slay, Swift masterminded her own narrative, but she couldn't always control how other people told it. Instead of recognizing her for her art, they recognized her for the way she dated. Yeah. And then you're going to have people who are going to say, oh, you know, like she's just writes songs about her ex-boyfriends. And I think, frankly, that's a very sexist angle to take. No one says that about Ed Sheeran. No yeah, one says right. it about Bruno Mars. They're all writing songs about their exes, their current girlfriends, their love life. And no one raises a red flag there. And even when the media wasn't being explicitly hostile with the slut shaming, interviewers still insisted that her love life was up for grabs. Mention her success, maybe, but ask about a new guy, Taylor Swift learned to expect it. Reports that you're dating Connor Kennedy. True. And if you were to write a song about your love life right now, happy song, sad song. Who are you seeing at the moment? Who is this about? The men in your life. I don't talk about my personal life. I don't really talk about that. I don't really talk about my love life. In making herself, her life, her authenticity into her brand, the public then felt like they had a right to have an opinion about it. And whether they do or don't is a complicated question, especially when she spearheaded and profited from giving the public access to her personal life and her art and online marketing. You become a brand as soon as you sell one thing. So you can either recognize it and embrace it or you can deny it and pretend it's not happening. Swift set the mood for her career. She was an early arrival to the 21st century social mediafication of life that we all experience today. Authenticity and personal experience makes for great art. And in the social media age, a great product. And if you're a woman, people especially take that as permission to scrutinize your personal life. Do other people have the right to comment on our personal lives when we give so much of it to the public? The 21st century is all about renegotiating those boundaries as they happen, as they form, as they break, and Taylor Swift is a huge part in putting that negotiation into action. And so, that concludes one part of the story of the last 20 years. But we've only just begun. Um, I think that as an artist, you try to change just to evolve for the sake of like keeping things exciting for your fans, keeping things exciting for you. Um, and so with this album, what I wanted to do was challenge myself by like getting in the studio with people that I love, like Ed Sheeran and Snow Patrol. <laughs> naturally evolves what you do and kind of blends it with what someone else does and it essentially just causes this evolution of sound and I was really proud of that on the record. Taylor Swift was nine years old when she first got into country music. Things change. People change. When I was nine I wanted to be a political lobbyist for the oil industry. People change. I was 22 making my fourth album and you have two choices at that point you can either make music the same way you've always made it uh, or you can change the way you do it after she spent her early career proving to the world that country music had a highly profitable youth demographic and honing her singer songwriter chops on speak now taylor swift became interested in new sounds new genres and collaborative styles she wanted to learn she established herself as a songwriter but now she wanted to grow her knowledge of hit making, 
sounds, production, hooks, beats. She recruited collaborators like Max Martin, the famously Swedish mastermind behind every hit song of the past 30 years. The result was Red. An eclectic mix of Swift's classic country songwriting, dubstep drops, poppy millennial angst, soul-destroying lyrics, boom claps, tumbler ukuleles, Something about it just captured the moment of being a messy 22-year-old in 2012. The album sounds extremely dated in that you can clearly tell this is an album from 2012, but also timeless because, you know, there's parts of 2012 that will always be inside of you. I think for me with this album, I just, I tended to really explore the edges of what I'm allowed to do. So. Red was a hit, and the Mayan calendar was a flop, but it had people wondering, is Swift still a country artist? Is she moving into pop star territory? Isn't it kind of weird that the CIA used to do mind control experiments on people? It was only a matter of time until Swift stopped playing games and fully crossed over. 1989 officially marked Swift's full transition into pop superstardom. It was a massive success commercially and critically. Um, in the end, it ended up being completely sonically cohesive. It's got its own sound. It is a pop album. I wanted to be very honest about that. How do you take a neoliberal, pure girlhood persona and turn her into a neoliberal capitalist queen? It's a hard sell. Pure pop music needs hooks catchy beats, in the moment parasitic vibrations with the burden of capturing the sound of the culture. But how do you do that with a brand built off authenticity, reflection, and free-flowing lyricism? She knew how to do catchy, but it was always romantic, surrounded by a sea of storytelling, changing imagery, and confession. How do you stay authentic. How do you stay relatable when pop stardom requires you to craft a transcendent, godlike image? In a sense, Taylor had to grow up. And if you know anything about these millennials, it's that they're terrible at adulting. She needed to be relatable to her millennial peers who faced a sense of disillusionment with the establishment after the financial crisis. 2012 millennials who are unable to find jobs post-graduation, unable to achieve upward mobility, finding this whole capitalism thing to be a little stupid, a little silly. The millennial couldn't help but feel a sense of detachment from it all. The whole adult thing, the industry, capital, it's all a performance over which we have no control. But the millennial found a way to grind through the pain with a bit of detached humor. Because if you can't find it in you to become a ruthless capitalist, then at least you can become a zany one. Contemporary culture is full of cope. We collectively develop these emotional and aesthetic ways of being as ways of integrating ourselves within the neoliberal status quo, even if we don't agree with the status quo. By aesthetic, I mean the experience of art and taste. Literary theorist Cyan Nye argues that mass culture is defined by three major aesthetic categories. Cute, zany, and interesting. We experience art in mass contemporary culture through these three lenses. Cute, zany, interesting. But let's focus on zany. In thinking of zany, you might think of some silly, idiosyncratic characters. But to be zany is also to be active, productive. There's a movement to it that straddles the line between work and play. And that's important. According to Nye, the zany aesthetic represents our relationship to work in contemporary capitalist culture. Cyan Nye sees the aesthetic of zaniness as a constant sense of precarity that one goes through incredible lengths to navigate. It's a performance of wacky nervousness. We laugh at the labor required to maintain the performance of success within a rigged system. Cultural analyst Marin Wilkinson argues that the Taylor Swift of 1989 embodies the zaniness described in Nye's book. Taylor Swift's shift from confessional songwriter to pop star required a change in the way the public perceived her relationship to her work. 
It's my contention that Swift shifted the discourse of authenticity that informed her country persona away from its focus on confessional truth-telling and Southern hard work towards one of the authentically zany, a figure who emphasizes the pop performance as one of hard work instead, because she exposed its construction as one that does not come naturally. The zany persona presented Swift as a comical, clumsy goofball, working hard at trying to adapt herself to the world of commercial entertainment. By presenting herself as the zany, Swift was able to position herself in this stage of her career, both as a constructed, hapless pop princess and an autonomous and savvy industry professional, all the while maintaining an authentic sense of hard work. Wilkinson uses the music video for the song Shake It Off as a prime example. We see Swift try on these different personas representing the deliberate labor that goes into crafting a music industry image. She works hard at her cultural performance, but deep down, as we can see, she's a relatable goofball. She's an adulting millennial just like you. She doesn't believe in tradition, grand narratives, pop star tropes. She's a normcore millennial queen who looks at late capitalist alienation right in the face and says, shake it off. I think it's much more tasteful and people can tolerate it more if I'm just laughing at the things that bother me. Right. Now, I don't think Swift read Cyan Nye and said, holy shit, I'm going to become the poppiest, zaniest voice of the post-Fortis mass culture. She's an artist. She doesn't analyze aesthetic categories, she taps into them intuitively. It takes genuine artistic genius for one to have their finger right up the hole of the prevailing existential dread of a particular generation. And she did it. All right, all right, all right. So let's do as good sociologists do. How is it racist? So upon its release in 2014, 1989 was a hit with a lot of critics, but it had major dissenters as well. At the center of this zany millennial madness was a critical reevaluation of pop music, and Taylor Swift became a major figurehead for something called poptimism. <sighs> so, back in the 80s, the most obnoxious people alive invented a debate between two groups of people who may or may not exist. On the one side are the rockists, and on the other side, are the poptimists. Both of these terms are loosely defined and depend on the critic, but I'm going to invent the real definitions for real this time. Rockists are a loose collection of people who believe that rock music is a unique genre of music that contains some inherent essence, ethos, or characteristic. And the rockists will say that rock's essence, ethos, identity, whatever, is fundamentally unique and valuable. So, for example, some people argued that rock music has an essence of authenticity, which makes it more artistic and valuable than pop music, which rockist critics saw as commercial and poop. As Douglas Wolk writes, Rockism, let's say, is treating rock as normative. In the rockist view, rock is the standard state of popular music, the kind to which everything else is compared explicitly or implicitly. So, for instance, it's a rockist opinion that pre-stereo era blues and country are interesting less in their own right than because they anticipated rock. Or that Run DMC and Alison Krauss are notable because their virtues are also the virtues of rock. Or that Sierra's goodies isn't interesting because it fails to act like rock. Wolk importantly notes that rockism is baked into the DNA of popular music criticism because a lot of the earliest publications that established popular music criticism, you know, like Rolling Stone, started in rock circles. Makes sense. But over the years, people wanted to push back on the whole rockism thing. Rockism got a bad reputation after a few decades because it became apparent that oftentimes, rockism was a thinly veiled way of favoring music by white guys for white guys. Rockism upheld this image of the cerebral, complex, white dude songwriter without considering that, you know, music is a lot more than that. There's a lot of beauty in diverse perspectives, in diverse sounds. Like, there have been plenty of non-white guys who've excelled at complex songwriting. More importantly, 
It's about time we acknowledge that the term artistic complexity is a bit of nebulous BS. Because there's nothing more inherently valuable about music that speaks to the revolution, man. A song doesn't need to speak to cultural revolutions or masculine alienation or even deep philosophical experiences to be a valuable song. Like, do you know how hard it is to make a catchy beat? And do you know how awesome it is to listen to one? Art can be mind-blowingly complex when speaking of the simple and beautifully simple in conveying a complex feeling. Meaningful art doesn't have to look one way, and our evaluation of that art doesn't have to abide by an arbitrary set of standards passed down by a bunch of white guys in the 60s. So, in comes Poptimism. According to the Poptimists, pop music is just as worthy of appreciation as rock music. A lot of these Poptimist writers were explicitly feminist and anti-racist and wrote at length about the ways pop music has been historically portrayed as feminine and racialized and how these associations informs the biases that music critics have had against pop music. Poptimism is the idea that musics that are traditionally dismissed for failing to reflect either the taste of white cis hetero men or the privileges and features stereotypically associated with them such as complexity, virtuosity, seriousness, etc., are just as aesthetically valuable and worthy of critical attention as the music's conventionally thought to speak to that audience and embody these values, such as rock. Popular music is thoroughly feminized. It exhibits all the things stereotypically attributed to women and femininity, such as superficiality, association with the body over the mind, simplicity and deficient mastery, formulaic obedience, and so on. And I think that's totally fair. There's a complex beauty in the so-called simpler pleasures. The pure raw human intuition of a dance beat is extremely valuable. And so what if Beyonce's renaissance has 104 credited songwriters? Collaboration is the driving force of human ingenuity. And as we discussed, the cultural construct of lone artistic genius is a historical construct. Stop, I'm sorry. A lot of the language that's used to dismiss pop music assumes a certain set of criteria that different generations should constantly reevaluate. So, if that's what poptimism is, then I'm on board with that. On the surface, rockism versus poptimism was a sustained debate from the late 80s to the early 2000s about the value of pop music and its characteristics. Below the surface was an early example of culture war discourse in which historically underrepresented groups wanted to reassess the values of white male-dominated institutions. Cool. The debate died down a bit in the 2000s, but was reignited in the 2010s in no small part due to 1989 dropped at the perfect moment for the incoming cultural shitstorm. 2014 was a special time. All that culture war stuff underlying age-old debates like poptimism versus rocktimism suddenly came to the forefront. It was indicative of a new era. The Great Awakening. Beyonce danced in front of the word feminist at the 2014 VMAs. Emma Watson spoke at the UN about feminism. The pop feminist movement was overtaking pop culture. Celebrities like Taylor Swift began to identify themselves as feminists. Songs in 1989 addressed the sexist stereotypes that had haunted her entire career. Think pieces, blogs, TV shows. And now the most important institution of it all faced a cultural reckoning music criticism. All right, so maybe it is a bit of a stupid niche debate, but there's something about this debate that I feel had a long lasting effect on the culture. Like, how should we evaluate art? What is the role of the critic? Are pop culture artifacts as worthy of critical evaluation as much as the great canonical works of art? We live in a thoroughly poptimist era. Video essays are a prime example of poptimism in action. Every day, video essayists implicitly claim that blockbuster movies or big TV shows, whether bad or good, are worthy of being evaluated with the same critical lens as any old work of the gay-ass Western canon. For many critics in 2014, Taylor Swift was the ambitious leader of a cultural and critical revolution. 
combining her knack for authentic songwriting, the ease with which she can write a catchy tune, and the collaborations in her new albums typical for pop masterpieces, it all came together perfectly so that Poptimism could ride the tide of 2014 pop feminism. Taylor was proving all the haters wrong. As a powerful woman, Taylor Swift proved a nice figurehead of a Poptimistic future. But is that an accomplishment worthy of celebration? Some sympathetic parties remained critical of the whole Poptimism thing. At what point does Poptimism just become a popularity contest to see who can soy out over their favorite capitalist queen the most, as if worshipping the moment's most profitable cultural object somehow makes you subversive? Does Poptimism just reinforce the same old power structures? Much like the pop feminism of the mid-2010s, the Poptimist movement easily falls into the trap of uplifting the struggles of the most privileged people. So, on the one hand, Poptimism's revaluation of music's traditionally devalued for their association with women, girls, and femininity does important work in recalibrating aesthetic values and taste to be more inclusive. However, in a context where the spectacle of affirmative feminism often eclipses a structural critique of patriarchy, Poptimism, like popular feminism in general, reigns in the progressive potential of feminism's politics by subordinating them to capitalist demands. At its best, Poptimism claimed that we should reconsider our relationship to art, to not discount the diverse experiences that people have to art, and to reevaluate the purpose of the critic and the criteria by which they critique. At its worst, it's a capitalist circle jerk. For the average 2010s Poptimist, Taylor Swift's 1989 cemented her legacy as a crafty millennial superstar. The album was on repeat in 2014 and 2015. You couldn't run away from it, and you couldn't help but sing along. It was good. In a few words, 1989 and its legacy sort of legitimated contemporary pop music in a way. It was a good record. It embraced pure pop, and it did well, like extremely well. Taylor Swift proved that there was room for critically adored pure pop in the 21st century. And listen, that's not to say that Swift was the first pop artist to be critically and culturally acclaimed, nor does someone's level of critical acclaim indicate that they're the best or most valuable artist. Rather, 1989, with its massive critical and commercial success, gave pure pop an elite form of cultural legitimacy. But the thing about claims to cultural legitimacy is that the methods by which contemporary mainstream culture legitimates or gives value to cultural objects are often rooted in oppressive institutions. In a weird and contradictory way, the ways we often uplift underrepresented voices ends up maintaining the structure that underrepresented these voices in the first place. Pop feminism in the 2010s, the companion movement to 2010s poptimism, attempted to bring feminism to the forefront of cultural life. But rather than address the large systemic structure of sexist oppression that is capitalist, patriarchy, whateverism, the movement simply pushed for privileged women to advance within the existing structure. Instead of reorganizing the patriarchal hierarchies of power, pop feminism gave white middle class women a path to join the top of the hierarchy. How do we understand Taylor Swift's legacy and the influence of poptimism in contemporary life? Well, as the poster on the wall of your 8th grade social studies class read, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. As it turns out, rockism and poptimism ironically have the same exact history. The way I see it, Taylor Swift is a part of a 21st century effort to legitimate or give cultural value to pop music. That is, we're watching parts of popular culture collide with traditional institutions in real time. I know this is happening because the same thing happened with the Beatles. And while I may not be a music historian, I am autistic. The Beatles, bring them on!
1964, the Beatles conquered the world. With international hits like Please Please Me and I Wanna Hold Your Ass playing on every radio station across the globe, it seemed as if the world was in a state of mass hysteria over these extremely normal looking guys. This truly is a social document for our time. But at this point, in 1964, their sound didn't differ too much from other pop boy bands who appealed to big female and homosexual audiences. And hanging around the stage door all seemed to be a bunch of slightly gay looking boys. Don't get me wrong, the songwriting was pretty good. Their songs had unusual chords for pop music, they wrote their own songs, which was unusual for the time in pop, and they were breaking records left and right. But how was the culture able to shift its image of the Beatles from a successful pop boy band to their contemporary status as the most critically and commercially successful band of all time? How did they become legends? And what does that have to do with Taylor Swift? All right, so again, in 1964, the Beatles conquer the world. They release some bangers, appear in your grandmother's wet dreams, and then in 1965, they started doing drugs and mingling with artsy types. Their songwriting matures, leading to the release of Rubber Soul. Bam! It was a total breakthrough in pop music. The album dealt with mature themes that felt more coherent than a lot of other pop music at the time. Boom. Then we get to 1966 with albums like Revolver and in 1967, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. On these albums, the Beatles began experimenting in the studio. And in that moment, for the first time in pop music, this music group discovered that they could use the studio as a musical instrument rather than a medium by which to record live music. Like... Imagine, in 1964, hearing one of their first hits, like She Loves You. She loves you yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in 1966, your hit with Tomorrow Never Knows. Oh my dude. Then, they start incorporating classical music techniques within their music. <laughs> taking rock to a new level it hadn't reached before. They invent tape loops and other innovative studio shit. They pioneer album-based music by releasing albums that sound like coherent sonic experiences rather than a collection of singles. And on top of all of that, the songs are just really goddamn catchy. Around this time, in the 1960s, music publications started popping up with critics writing about all these new innovations that bands like The Beatles and The Beach Boys were pushing. People started hailing the Beatles as popular music gods. And just as a side note, at this point in history, the words popular music and rock music were used interchangeably. So in the 1960s, music critics began to claim that because of the Beatles and their musical innovations, popular music earned a new cultural legitimacy. Critics and elite institutions began to see popular music as an art form as music that had to be listened to, understood, analyzed, contextualized. But how were the Beatles able to obtain this cultural legitimacy? Their innovations were huge, but it wasn't just innovation that propelled them to legend status. Diverse groups of people had been innovating in popular music for decades. No, this was about institutional recognition. The Beatles were able to speak to the musical language of the elite institutions who write our cultural narratives. How exactly? Because the Beatles took rock and roll, a historically African-American genre of music, and made it more European. Now listen, on its face, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Cultural exchange is cool. It's cool when diverse cultures respectfully borrow from one another. That's one of the beauties of diversity. But in the real world, cultural exchange doesn't exist in a vacuum. We have to be aware of the underlying cultural hierarchy that penetrates our everyday experience. We have to be aware of the standards of value used by our cultural institutions in academia, industry, and elite critical circles. When we do that, we're able to recognize that the Beatles took rock and roll, added European influence, and thus 
In the eyes of historically white musical institutions, the Beatles' Europeanization of rock gave rock a new special type of legitimacy and cultural value. The Beatles, through incorporating European Western harmony and arrangements, ended up appealing to elite white culture's elevation of European styles of music by appealing to these upper middle class white tastes through European styles the Beatles won over the influential class of listeners who control the means of cultural production. But the Beatles weren't the only pop group innovating in the mid-60s in this way. Bands like the Beach Boys similarly incorporated European styles of music into their work. One of the band's main songwriters, Brian Wilson, said that he wanted to capture a white spiritual sound in his hugely influential album, Pet Sounds. Bands like the Beatles and Beach Boys represented an important moment in which rock and roll became white. These bands incorporated harmonic techniques typical of Western classical music. They replaced rhythm with string arrangements, harpsichords, and literal orchestras. The Beatles hold a special place in music history because they were the most popular group able to convince the white musical world that rock and popular music was an art form worthy of critical evaluation. But of course we gotta notice the word there, worthy. To become worthy, you have to prove yourself to the existing systems of power. The Beatles did that by, as I said, taking a popular traditionally black art form and giving it a European identity. Back in the day, the Beatles were called the greatest composers since Beethoven, hearkening back to the good old European classics. People today still praise them for saving Western music. Through the Beatles and their passionate belief in it that we owe the dramatic comeback of the Western musical system. Music historian Elijah Wald writes that considering this, it's fair to view the Beatles not as innovators, but as rearguard holding actions, attempting to maintain older European standards as the streamlining force of rhythm rolled over them. He goes on to argue that the Beatles actually spearheaded the racial resegregation of popular music taste. Let me explain what that means. Back in 1942, the Billboard charts created a new music chart that tracked the best-selling black music of a given week. This was created to reflect the different listening tastes of different audiences, and they were explicit about the racial aspect of it. The chart debuted under the title Harlem Hit Parade, then race records, until they finally settled on hot R&B singles in 1958. But then a new form of R&B appeared on the scene called rock and roll, and it became the most popular genre of music. Rock and roll was enjoyed by both black and white audiences, and for the first time in a long time, popular music became desegregated. So, in 1963, Billboard discontinued the R&B chart. This was just as the civil rights movements in the United States gained national prominence. The American color line was as visible as ever, and it seemed like music could be a frontier that brought Americans together. But then in comes the Beatles. In 1965, the same year the Beatles started innovating and incorporating old Western European elements into their music, the more segregated popular music became. That same year, 1965, Billboard reinstated the R&B charts. It was a reflection of America's increasing racial divide. Wald argues that the Beatles are a crucial part of this story the story of how rock became, well, white. And listen, I am a huge fan of the Beatles. Need I remind you that I wrote a 50,000 word Beatles fan fiction that may or may not involve sexual acts between John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And I'm also a fan of European Western music. Not to be controversial or anything, but Mozart popped the fuck off. And the Beach Boys? I'm literally in a Beach Boys cover band. <laughs> But I can also acknowledge that while these famous artists are important in the history of music, the history of music, like all history, is littered with a bunch of inequality, discrimination, and cultural forces that are anything but meritocratic. Like, why isn't James Brown hailed as 
one of the great innovators of music since Beethoven, when honestly, his rhythmic innovations feel a lot more relevant to pop music in the 21st century. My overall point is to emphasize that the process by which artists become enshrined in cultural legend involves ideological baggage. Culture-wide appreciation requires culture-wide values. And you can bet those values aren't free from the biases that permeate our society. The Beatles could ignore the rhythmic advances of their time, and if in the process they stopped being part of the teen dance mix, they still sold millions of records to people who regarded them as musical prophets. Those who bought into the Beatles' cultural prophecy became the rockists. So let the record show that rockism was born out of a type of poptimism, out of a crucial moment in the 1960s when rock artists and rock critics claimed that rock music deserved cultural appreciation. Yet even now there are those who say that if music has mass appeal, it can't also be music of great significance or depth. What the Beatles proved once and for all is that this idea is hopelessly, absurdly wrong. But cultural institutions only became receptive to that claim when rock artists learned to speak the language of the white elite. So, why did I just tell you about the process of the Beatles' cultural legitimation? Because this is what happened and what is happening with Taylor Swift. She's the best-selling digital artist of all time. She has seven Grammy Awards, five homes, and a jet. Oh, and she's only 24 years old. I thought I was ambitious. Let me emphasize that 1989 is a freaking banger album. Blank Space, Wildest Dreams, Style, Dude. It had a nostalgic sound that preceded a lot of the nostalgic 80s and 70s influenced pop that we hear today. The boom clap 80s production hits really freaking well. So yeah, she may represent white neoliberal feminism, but she's also an incredible artist. Similarly, the Beatles weren't successful just because they were white. Any old white guy could be white. The Beatles were incredible songwriters in the right place, at the right time, playing the right music to the right listeners. Taylor Swift is also an incredible songwriter at the right place at the right time, and even when she's not creating cultural trends, she hits these cultural moments exactly when she needs to. But that immense talent interacts with our culture in suspect ways. Let's go over the ways people talked and talk about Taylor Swift. When 1989 first appeared on the scene, critics, especially Poptimist critics, were in love. She brought a new authenticity with her catchy melodies and zany personality. And critics distinguished her from her contemporaries in strange ways. Swift's latest album, 1989, is a Poptimistic curveball that ignores the dance urban trend and replaces it with something more ambitious. Right, Swift is more ambitious than those dancing urban people, Danger. whoever they might be. In a retrospective on 1989, one critic wrote, since most of her then competitors were borrowing heavily from modern hip hop, centering her foray into pop on a unique sound from another era helped prevent Swift from blending in. The result is an ambitious album that somehow felt classic the moment it was released. Taylor Swift wasn't doing hip hop like those other losers. She was classic. She'd rather see her life as she plays it in her songs, as a classic movie, not an Instagram story. Taylor Swift was portrayed as timeless, classic, ambitious, representing something different than the hip hop and urban trends of her day. Something. <laughs> now I'm not saying that this is proof that these critics are intentionally malicious or that they're intentionally dog whistling to a racist audience. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. We're all products of the culture in which we are born and culture has hierarchies that we all internalize. I don't know these reviewers, 
I don't know Taylor Swift. But if we look at Swift and all these comments as a discourse, as a part of a larger story of history, then it's easier to hold a critical lens to the cultural material we hold dear. What type of discourses was the Swift of 2014 a part of? While I wouldn't say Taylor Swift is intentionally or consciously racist, there is something deeply white about her image and her music. That doesn't mean that people of color can't enjoy her music or haven't enjoyed her music in the past. I enjoy her music, but that her image certainly represents something culturally white. It's not a coincidence that around this time, far right and white supremacist movements began to sincerely co-opt Swift's image. Neo websites published articles calling Swift an Aryan goddess. In a 2016 article on Breitbart, far-right commentator and human punchline Milo Yiannopoulos praised Swift by writing, Let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. Swift is very white and very blonde. She was born on and grew up in a Christmas tree farm in rural Pennsylvania. You heard me right, a Christmas tree farm. Little wonder the tradition-oriented alt-right are swimming. Compared to her peers in the Babylon that is modern pop music, Swift has kept her aesthetic, well, decidedly conservative. She wears long dresses, eschews piercings, and, as Metrolin points out, carries her handbag like a 1950s housewife. Most people miss those little details, but the alt-right does not. They're convinced she's signaling. Right. Or alt-right. And though I don't think Swift intentionally perpetuated the Aryan goddess image, there's a reason her persona attracted that crowd. And I think Milo Yiannopoulos, in crude language, accidentally describes why Taylor Swift's mid-2010s persona appealed to both white supremacists and powerful cultural industries. Swift doesn't look like other pop stars, who are either white people acting black or black people who seem to get whiter every year. She appears more comfortable in her own skin and doesn't go in for racial ambiguity. There's something transcendently normal about Swift, the neoliberal zany figure that embraces the white status quo with an unflashy coolness. Let me explain. Racial ideology, well, this took a turn. Racial ideology, or the taken-for-granted racial meanings of everyday life, comes in different forms. One common version of Western racial ideology argues for the explicit superiority of white people over non-white people. But then there's a more contemporary, neoliberal version of Western racism in which whiteness isn't explicitly depicted as uniquely supreme or superior. In neoliberal racial ideology, the culture establishes whiteness as a norm, as the neutral or the standard, while non-white people are cast as other, different, or extra. White is considered normal, while non-white is considered abnormal. As historically white cultural and physical characteristics become the standard, they also become invisible to us, while non-white cultural and physical characteristics become hyper-visible. We take whiteness and westernness for granted as normal or natural, but this hides the racist historical process that positioned white western culture at the top of the hierarchy. There is a reason why if I type normal guy on Google Images, the majority of the results are white guys. Or why, when the Star Wars Force Awakens trailer dropped in 2014, people called the film anti-white because Finn was a black person who literally just existed. But to connect this to Taylor Swift, we must return to the goddamn Shake It Off music video. We're about to go do the twerking. Here we have Swift, the zany, hardworking, neoliberal millennial who laughs through the precarity of the 21st century through goofy authenticity. The video shows Swift as an awkward goofball who fails to conform to contemporary stylistic trends, many of them explicitly associated with certain racial demographics. And the video makes the racial aspect strangely clear. Here, she's too zany for the white feminine ballerinas, and in another scene, she's shocked at twerking hip-hop dancers who are disproportionately women of color. I mean, 
the juxtaposition between these two moments is a little weird. Maybe it's a coincidence, but it's strange. And regardless of intentions, makes a statement to the viewers, at least implicitly. In the midst of these incredibly disciplined, beautiful, sophisticated, we're about to go do the twerking. The video shows us that she's too zany and millennial to fit into the music industry's predefined tropes, but finally, she settles into a performance in which she feels comfortable. She wears a black Audrey Hepburn style outfit. It's so plain, it's so normal. It's so nothing. It transcends trope and archetype. It's just nothing. Or is it? Scholar Robin James explores this nothingness in their work, The Sonic Episteme. However, because Swift is white, her non-brandedness reads as uncool rather than as pathology. She doesn't fail to meet the imperative to be cool. She transcends it. Swift shakes off both gendered and genre stereotypes and the external judgment of others. She doesn't need to concern herself with the market value others place on her, with her reputation. She's free to be boring and vanilla, because that's what she is. This freedom, the ability to succeed while being resolutely average, think George W. Bush, that's the whiteness Swift's hedge bet returns in abundance. It's this nothingness that constitutes Swift's whiteness. It is this transcendence that will propel her to cultural legend status. She's a master at it. In her early career, she knew how to build herself as this perfect white neoliberal girl subject. And in the mid 2010s, that neoliberal girl grew into a zany norm core millennial whose tunes speak to the heart of the traditionally white institutions that give music its perceived cultural value. Shake It Off isn't failed cool. It's an elite disidentification with coolness. Again, this isn't to say that Swift intentionally planned her career around racialized acts, but she learned to master a music industry built on cultures of racial injustice. Maybe that's why she failed to disavow her white supremacist fan base in the mid 2010s. I mean, better to just ignore the bad press, right? Well, I guess not, because in 2017, her lawyer threatened to sue a blogger for defamation for criticizing Swift's silence on the alt-right fans. Oh, but you know what? She claims that she didn't have internet on her phone in 2017 and had no idea about any of it. So it's okay, guys. Put together, there's a thread that runs through Milo Yiannopoulos' alt-right praise, the critics who acclaimed her ambition in avoiding urban trends and in Robin James' cultural analysis. Taylor Swift became the figurehead of a type of millennial white norm that brought cultural acclaim and legitimacy to pop in the 2010s. And by transitioning into a zany figure, she could maintain the appearance of an authentic, fun-loving goofball with good intentions. And though the pop feminist movement of the 2010s died down a bit, the ideas behind it remain entrenched in popular consciousness, especially in millennial popular consciousness. Robin James once again signals what the late 2010s would bring for Swift, pop culture and music criticism. Both popular feminism and corporate poptimism are the result of the same flawed thinking that believes inequality can be fixed just by empowering individuals and not by restructuring the institutions and conventions that structure our relations with one another. This thinking seeks to put formerly low status things in high status places without reconfiguring the underlying fact that there is a status differential in the first place. In the meantime, Swift enjoyed the fruits that 2015 would bring. She was on top, but it wouldn't last forever. And though the spirit of 1989 may have drifted into nostalgia, popular feminism and poptimism never truly died. The neoliberal zaniness behind them evolved. And in 2016, something in the millennial consciousness shifted.
problem I think we all deal with and an issue we deal with on a daily basis um, that we don't live just in a celebrity takedown culture we live in a takedown culture people will find anything about you and twist it to where it's weird or wrong or annoying or or strange or bad you have to not only live your life in spite of people who who don't understand you you have to have more fun than they do. All right, so picture this. February 2016, Kanye West releases his new album, Life of Pablo. You in your 2016 ignorance feel a swell of excitement and listen through. The fourth track on the album, Famous, rings in your ears. Oh. In a reference to the 2009 VMAs incident, Kanye seemingly provoked Taylor Swift's response. Shortly after, Swift's publicist released this response to BuzzFeed. Kanye did not call for approval, but to ask Taylor to release his single Famous on her Twitter account. She declined and cautioned him about releasing a song with such a strong misogynistic message. Taylor was never made aware of the actual lyric, I made that bitch famous. The day the statement went public, West took to Twitter to voice his side of the story, claiming that Swift approved of the line and that he meant Bitch as an endearing remark. A few days later, Taylor Swift's 1989 wins a Grammy for Album of the Year, and she takes the moment to emphasize something important. I want to say to all the young women out there, there are going to be people along the way who will try to undercut your success or take credit for your accomplishments or your fame. But if you just focus on the work and you don't let those people sidetrack you, someday when you get where you're going, you'll look around and you will know that it was you and the people who love you who put you there. And that will be the greatest feeling in the world. Though she didn't mention Kanye West by name, people took the moment as an implicit reference to the newly ignited feud. A few months pass. Swift goes platinum, and after a few months of hinting that she'd be going on hiatus soon, in April she tells Vogue that she's taking a break from recording. In May, she meets Tom Hiddleston in one of the whitest interactions I've ever seen, and now it's June. It's about to become the worst summer of her life. On June 16th, GQ magazine interviews Kim Kardashian, Kanye West's wife at the time, and she claims that Taylor Swift lied about the famous lyrics incident. She totally approved that. Kim says, shaking her head in annoyance. She totally knew that that was coming out. She wanted to all of a sudden act like she didn't. And in response, Swift's team sent another statement to GQ, reiterating that Kanye West never told Taylor he was going to use the term that bitch in referencing her. A month later, It's war! And it all started when Kim Kardashian released video of husband Kanye West secretly recording his conversation with Taylor Swift. For all my Southside that know me best, I feel like me and Taylor might still have sex. I know, Definitely. it's like a compliment to <laughs> While Kim Kardashian only leaked a portion of the video, it appears as if Taylor Swift gave Kanye permission to say the line. Um, yeah, I mean, what, don't put up a line, it's better. It's obviously very tongue-in-cheek either way. But Taylor argues that the footage doesn't prove anything, as in the footage, she never gave Kanye permission to use the word bitch to describe her. In fact, the full video was leaked in 2020, and we can see her express explicit discomfort with being called a bitch. Oh my god, the build up you gave it, I thought it was gonna be like that stupid dumb bitch. Like, but it's not. But people in 2016 still took Kim and Kanye's side of the story, and the public proceeded to label Swift a liar and a snake. Then, alongside some Calvin Harris drama, which is an extremely 2016 phrase to say, people fully turned against her. Hashtag Taylor Swift is over party trended worldwide. It seemed as if the world had finally turned on Taylor Swift. After a decade of offering her life to the public, they decided to decline. When people fall out of love with you, there's nothing you can do to make them change their mind. They just don't love you anymore. And so she disappeared.
Swift would never again be America's sweetheart, and America didn't want her to be. Neither did she. In 2017, America was done with sweethearts. Donald Trump took office in January 2017, reflecting the divided state of American political and cultural life. The popular feminism of the mid-2010s bled into common parlance as young millennial women across America rightfully angry at the casual misogyny of everyday life saw virtue in equally casual antagonistic individual resistance. Nevertheless, she persisted. If Donald Trump called Hillary Clinton a nasty woman, such a nasty trust, woman, you bet liberal white women would have it all over t-shirts the next morning. Women were again justifyingly frustrated with having to play nice and polite in the face of everyday sexism. So too was Swift done playing nice. But she was still playing the game of pop culture narratives. And in typical Swiftian fashion, she wanted to retain control over that narrative. Instead of running from her reputation, she embraced it. The old Taylor can't come to the phone right now. This was reputation. It was a darker mood for a bit of a darker turn in culture. An attempted self-awareness of the signifier that was Taylor Swift, nasty woman. Rather than bury caricatures of herself in the past, she appropriated them as a part of her mythos. She no longer clinged onto perfect neoliberal purity. Whether you hated her or loved her, she grabbed your attention by making her image as dynamic as the people listening to her music. She knew you were changing, and she wanted you to know that she was changing with you. Taylor Swift uses this hyper-awareness of her own image to calculate every step she takes. Take her word for it, not mine. If enough people say the same thing about me, it becomes fact in the general public's mind. So I monitor what people say about me, and if I see a theme, I know what that means. It's happened twice before. In 2010, it was she's too young to get all these awards, look at how annoying she is when she wins, is she even good? And then in 2013, it was she just writes songs about guys to get revenge. She's boy crazy. She's a problematic person. It will probably be something else again this year. Well, if the world was turning on Swift, calling her a fake, conniving victim, she had to find a way to delicately balance criticism, a sympathetic narrative, and authenticity. That's what she tried with Reputation. It didn't work. Reputation polarized the public, who in 2017 were famously politically unified. Contemporary culture critics like Constance Grady argued that Taylor Swift's reinvention in reputation didn't really create the sympathetic narrative that has historically favored the pop singer. Since the beginning of her career, Swift's celebrity image has been caught in a tug of war between intimacy and control. One characterized by two distinct identities. Taylor Swift, nerdy teen and girl next door, who just happens to naturally be able to give voice to your deepest feelings in her songs. And Taylor Swift, micromanaging CEO of a billion dollar business whose marquee product is her own public image. Both sides are fundamental to Swift's appeal, but they are also antithetical to each other. When the two sides of her persona clash, they cancel each other out resulting in a swift backlash like the one that's formed heading into reputation. And this was compounded by the fact that, oh yeah, society freaking hates nasty women. So playing the part of one while trying to maintain the public sympathy isn't gonna work. Reputation sold well, but according to Taylor Swift, What I've always wanted to do and my main goal above everything else is to beat what I've done before. Since reputation wasn't as big as 1989, in that sense, it was a failure. Um, in the main, the big categories of album, record, song, um, you are not nominated. The documentary Miss Americana, though released in 2020, recounts the events after the release of Reputation leading up to her next album, Lover. Its narrative centers Taylor Swift's attempt to rebuild from the ashes of the past she proclaimed to be dead in Reputation. And this time, it worked. With Reputation, Taylor Swift attempted to reinvent her image, but the public, through these various controversies, 
develop this image of Taylor Swift as calculating and manipulative. The controversies turned audiences hyper aware of the way celebrities perform, construct, and protect their images. So nearly any reinvention Swift could have attempted was doomed to fail. The public was disillusioned with the reality behind the curtain. So with the relative failure of reputation, Swift knew that she needed to change her strategy. If the curtain had been lifted forever, then what strategy could convince the public to believe in her authenticity while accepting a new Taylor Swift? There was no going back. Swift decided to transcend the concept of reinvention itself. The documentary, Miss Americana, makes the audience hyper aware of celebrity reinvention. Swift wants to make it appear as if she's not hiding anymore. She wants you to know that she crafts her public image and makes sure that you know that she knows that you know. And in doing so, she hides the ways that she's profited from image crafting by critiquing and transcending its negative effects that it's had on her self-esteem, on women, on political discourse. The female artists that I know of have reinvented themselves 20 times more than the male artists. And she's right. In the age of social media, young people feel as if they have to craft this perfect version of themselves to sell to the public. We perpetually live our lives as if someone is watching, as if someone is evaluating us. Be new to us. Be young to us. But only in a new way and only the way we want and reinvent yourself, but only in a way that we find to be equally comforting, but also a challenge for you. Live out a narrative that we find to be interesting enough to entertain us, but not so crazy that it makes us uncomfortable. But of course, the documentary's meta conversation about celebrity image crafting is still celebrity image crafting. Maybe it's a different type, a better type. Maybe it's more self-aware, maybe it's more sincere, but it's still image crafting and I don't know if she'd deny this. In recent years, she's been a lot more open about the way she deliberately plans her business. And Taylor Swift wants you to know that in becoming more aware of the business of celebrity, she's trying to be better. Good. The beginning of the documentary portrays her image crafting as the result of insecurities and a drive to be perceived as good. You know, my entire moral code as a kid and now is a need to be thought of as good. But what is good? Who gets the final say over what defines this aspirational goodness? According to scholar Annalot Prinz, women's sexual freedom has been historically regulated and constrained by discourses of respectable femininity. Women's social value was measured against the dichotomy of good innocent girls versus bad sexual girls. Miley Cyrus has been voted the worst female celebrity role model for children. Great impact on yes, these yes. kids. 78% of them responded that Miley Cyrus was the worst role model. Let's go straight into your opinion as a role model for young girls. This dichotomy serves to pressure women to conform to patriarchal standards of femininity. Though these tropes are still present in popular discourses, Prinz argues that in the contemporary moment, millennials have more or less abandoned this scheme of moral evaluation. That doesn't mean millennials abandoned moral indignation altogether. Humans love pretending to get angry. But younger generations of fans don't evaluate female celebrities' goodness or badness through the framework of their sexuality. Most of us youngs, not all of us, but most of us are pretty desensitized to seeing ass in music videos. And you know what? Good for ass. Instead, younger generations evaluate a female celebrity's goodness or badness through political frameworks. Is Bay woke? Is Bay problematic? Did Bay release a statement on the latest geopolitical tragedy? And uh, while I'd like to think that this reflects young people's outstanding political engagement, oftentimes, as Prinz argues, this celebrity moral regulation is another moment in a long patriarchal history of regulating the narratives around women's actions. Now, it's cool that younger generations have such political passions, and there's definitely value in criticizing public figures and demanding accountability from the celebrities who take our support for granted. But it's also important to note that forms of oppression, like patriarchy, 
are really good at adapting to shifts in the culture. Sometimes we want to cancel Bay because she's genuinely problematic, and other times we want to cancel Bay because we hold women to unrealistic standards of moral purity. Sometimes it's both, and it's almost never one or the other. As Prinz notes, there's a long history of Western cultures upholding womanhood, particularly white womanhood, as this vessel for moral purity. Traditional patriarchy assumes that white women, compared to men, are somehow free of lustful sexual desire and are thus tasked with raising the next generation in a righteous manner. Importantly, women of color weren't and aren't seen with the same moral reverence. In a sense, patriarchy expects women, again particularly white women, to do what Prinz calls ideological labor in maintaining society's moral purity through socially acceptable activist routes. There's tons of historical examples. In 18th century America, a phenomenon called Republican motherhood expected women to raise children with American civil ideals. In the 19th century, women were encouraged to join social reform movements that emphasized issues of social purity, like banning alcohol and sex work. And now, in the 21st century, white women carry the mantle of white feminism, and Swift exemplifies that moment. White feminism is a certain type of or lens of feminism that fails to consider intersectional lenses and advocates for causes relevant to white women, but that aren't necessarily helpful for people of color or working class women. It's a complicated history and patriarchy is stupidly difficult to untangle. It's important to keep all this in mind when thinking about the ways the documentary Miss Americana frames Taylor Swift's eventual entry into political discourse in 2018. And to keep in mind the fact that Swift is extremely careful and very skillful in crafting her image. While she may not know the history of white women's moral purity, or maybe she does, at the very least that history is implicit in the narrative of the persona that she crafts. So as the documentary portrays, around 2018, Taylor Swift wants to reclaim her good image, but the girlhood purity that she projected in 2009 doesn't resonate with her fans anymore. They've grown up, they've become woke, canceling, social justicing millennials. She needs to let them know that she's right there with them, but she also has to do this in a way that condemns fake image crafting. So, in an extremely genius move, she transcends criticisms of her fakeness by portraying her desire to build a good public image as the result of insecurities and patriarchal conditioning, thereby linking a political cause to her identity and showing her new authenticity through political virtues. And again, there's a good chance that there's sincerity behind the whole thing. I'm sure she holds progressive values, believes in feminist causes, and has genuine insecurities, but we should remain conscious of the fact that even if it's a true story, she is deliberately telling a story. In Miss Americana, the construction of Swift's political awakenings reflect the neoliberal political narratives of her generation. By claiming control over her voice, Swift presents herself as a more authentic than before and by extension, as a better person than she ever has been. Swift has historically shied away from politics and she credits this to witnessing the public backlash to the Dixie Chicks critiques of George W. Bush in 2003. From that moment, the music industry had discouraged figures like Swift from inserting explicitly political comments into their image. Fast forward to the year in which the documentary takes place, 2018, the period before the upcoming midterm elections in the United States. Much of the drama of the story surrounds her decision to speak out against conservative candidate for Tennessee Senate Marsha Blackburn, whom she dislikes for various reasons. She votes against against fair pay for women. She votes against the reauthorization of the of the Violence Against Women Act. She votes, she thinks that, that if you're a gay couple, or even if you look like a gay couple, you should be allowed to be kicked out of a restaurant. It's and while Swift is genuinely engaged with the issues at hand, there's an undercurrent to this documentary that's difficult to ignore. Unlike women of color or working class women, rich white women are far less likely to experience the material effects of oppression in their everyday lives, and thus 
we get moments like this. Okay, I'm not so, gonna lie, I'm a little nervous. You should be. Where Swift sits in a multi-million dollar mansion, pouring a glass of wine with her publicist to calm her nerves because she's about to make a political Instagram post. All right, cheers. Oh, cheers, cheers, ladies. God help us all. Cheers to the resistance. Or her sitting in a private jet crying because her candidate didn't win. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I know. I can't believe your private jet use has resulted in the most carbon emissions out of any celebrity either. Fuck Earth, I guess. Like many of her fellow liberal millennial white women, Swift wants to identify herself with the new political age of righteous social justice. Otherwise, she'd be an irrelevant old. But like many of the wealthy millennial white women who marched in women's marches and retweeted think pieces in the 2010s, their work ends with speaking out and their critiques are never systemic. Throughout the documentary, she portrays her narrative as a new awareness, a consciousness raising. I think that it is so frilly and spineless of me to stand on stage and be like, happy Pride Month, you guys, and then not say this. And hey, it would be hypocritical of me to not stand by the power of spreading awareness and critique. I'm a goddamn YouTuber. Speaking out is cool and awesome. But our pop cultural hellscape co-opted the language of social justice and redirected it towards politically ineffective personal pseudo-spiritual awakenings, as Prinz rightly states. She's relieved that she will now, in her own words, finally be seen as good. The documentary uses maturity to mark the new, woker version of Swift as morally good and possessed of an agentic stardom. She's a good girl not because she is sexually restrained, but because she is capable of self-directed political growth. Hers is a politics born from self-realization rather than obligation. To Swift's credit, she has acknowledged her unique privileges, and generally her beliefs seem genuine. You know, I mean, nobody wants to sit there and talk to me about like, oh, people are saying things about me that aren't true. It's so sad. It's so hard. It's so <laughs> hard to live this life. It's like, first of all, it's not hard. <laughs> Thank you. But there's a reason that this documentary frames the political through the lens of her personal journey without diving into the systemic issues at hand. Swift uses progressive politics to construct her new good image. I've educated myself now, and it's time to take the masking tape off of my mouth. But she hasn't committed to any particular political agenda that might actually get something done. Just a vague signaling to progressive self-righteousness. And you know what? I never expected this documentary to make any sustained systemic critique. Taylor Swift is smart enough to know that progressive activism doesn't sell. The aesthetic of it does. In the end, she's not telling a story about progressive activism. She's telling a story about how progressive stances became tools for cultivating a profitable image. That's not to say that one's personal experiences can't be a part of good activism. In a recent video, the video essayist Lily Alexandra argues that discussions of one's personal journey can be a crucial part of learning how to challenge patriarchy. Being a good feminist, and yes, there is such a thing, starts with understanding what systems create and allow violence. And this is a healing process all by itself. The responsibility of feminist writers is to organize the chaos of women's trauma into stories we can tell. Stories that reveal the beginnings of oppression, that empathize with us in the uncomfortable middle, and most importantly, that remind us that every story has an end. But how does Taylor Swift's story end? I'm trying to be as educated as possible on how to respect people, on how to deprogram the misogyny in my own brain. Her resistance ends with herself, for herself. And in this way, she successfully reasserts her place as the late 2010s version of a good neoliberal subject. This narrative of resistance fits the criteria of what scholar Robin James calls neoliberal resistance discourses in pop music. According to James, 21st century pop music contains a certain aesthetic of resistance that responds and ultimately conceals the precarity of contemporary capitalism. Neoliberalism upgrades systems designed to secure against, conquer, or otherwise cover damage. The point of the upgrade is to make these systems more efficient means of social and economic management. 
Instead of expending resources to avoid damage, Resilience Discourse recycles damage into more resources. Resilience Discourse thus follows a very specific logic. First, damage is incited and made manifest. Second, that damage is spectacularly overcome, and that overcoming is broadcast and or shared, so that, third, the person who has overcome is rewarded with increased human capital, status, and other forms of recognition and recompense. Because, finally, and most importantly, this individual's own resilience boosts society's resilience. The work this individual does to overcome their own damage generates surplus value, for hegemonic institutions. Swift's resilience ultimately serves to maintain her position in the industry, to maintain the image of her brand, a brand that makes a lot of important people a lot of money. Damage, oppression, suffering, it's all recycled into the capitalist machine that poops out a narrative crafted for public consumption, where even a goddamn charity donation is branded with her signature number 13 because she knows that people will be watching. And even this undoubtedly good act, this worthy material redistribution becomes a part of her narrative, her awakening. But I have to remind you, when I tell the story of Taylor Swift, I'm also telling the story of all of us. The late 2010s drove many of us to see the world in a different light. Social media brought attention to social movements as new generations of people were driven to care about social justice. Even if social media absolutely feeds on the worst of our instincts, at least it drove us to care. And if forced to choose between a politics, of care that speaks with naive, good intentions versus a politics of misanthropic apathy, then I choose to be f***ing naive. But there's another aspect to that choice. Capitalism has a nasty habit of commodifying and mechanically reproducing objects of mass interest, social movements included. And thus, as individuals thrown into the anarchic social media arena were forced into these really short-sighted individualistic lenses. As commodities, social movements under contemporary capitalism are sold to us as ways of improving our individual goodness. That's what a neoliberal system wants out of individuals. It wants us to cancel people. It wants us to focus on a world of individuals and intentions and to forget the world of systems and structure. It wants us to view the world as a collection of individuals we have to purity test. It uses commodified, algorithmic social movements to make us forget our power to truly challenge systemic issues lies in collective action. Communities organized towards a material goal, an alternative social infrastructure. Though there is an important difference between the average individual and Taylor Swift, as the rest of us sit in perpetual anxiety as we scroll past images of cats, followed by images of war, and all the ways that we are bad, and all the ways that we aren't good enough, we wish that we as individuals could do something about a world that is crumbling behind a screen. But millionaires and billionaires don't have to wish. After the release of Lover in 2019 and the end of a decade of Taylor Swift, we begin to see the reconstruction of her image pay off. She's crowned Artist and Woman of the Decade by the American Music Awards and Billboard, respectively. But just as she was gearing up to tour the album, the COVID-19 pandemic stalled all future plans. When lockdown happened, I just found myself completely listless and purposeless and... It, that, and that was in the first three days of it. Like the rest of us, Swift found herself isolated and like many of us, turned this isolation into a moment for creative experimentation. Just 11 months after Lover, Swift announced that she was dropping a new album, Folklore. Unlike her previous albums, there wasn't any extended rollout. She just did it. Taylor Swift has a certain knack for latching onto cultural moments. She knew when to be a puritine, she knew when to become a pop sensation, and she knew when to get into politics. And in 2020, she knew that the world needed something intimate and alternative. You know, the pandemic and lockdown and all that runs through this album like a thread because it's an album that allows you to feel your feelings and it's a product of isolation. It's a product of all this. As a result, Folklore brought listeners new low-key indie sounds and aesthetics. And for the first time, the songs 
weren't about her personal life, but stories about other lives, affairs, and lovers. This was the, the first album that I've ever let go of that need to be 100% autobiographical because I think I felt like I needed to do that and I mm. felt like fans needed to hear like a stripped from the headlines account of my life. Taylor Swift was present, but she opened the door for those under lockdown to escape into her cottage core fantasies. When you are young, they assume you know nothing. Getting that indie sound with a bit of classic Swiftian flair required collaborations with her longtime producer Jack Antonoff and indie rock guitarist Aaron Dessner. A few months later, Folklore's sister album, Evermore, brought similar vibes to a similar time. Somehow, after a decade of work, Swift brought millions of people comfort in a new way, catching the wave of culture at just the right time. The albums were a massive critical and commercial success. A few years passed into 2022. Many of us left our homes and realizing that we lost all sense of social reality, things got a bit messy. I think that's the spirit of Swift's 2022 album, Midnights. It was another huge commercial success, but this time with months of promotion. In fact, it's one of her most commercially successful albums to date. And also, coincidentally, it's a banger of an album. It's good. The synths are delicious. I want to eat them. Yes, there were controversies. There were things to unpack. Some perhaps better suited for a Twitter thread. But I think with Midnights, she found a way to repackage criticism into the messiness of the moment. She's the anti-hero. She sings about being the problem. I'm the problem it's me. She doesn't zanily satirize her critics as she did in 1989. She doesn't try to reclaim the narrative as she does with reputation. It becomes a new aesthetic category, something at the intersection of messy, honest, and capable. At the same time, as we all grew up on social media, We've all become image crafters in our own way. We see right through celebrity performance and Swift, one of the first people to master online image crafting, knows that we do. She tries to extract relatability from her exhaustion with self-branding and yeah, we're all exhausted with it too. She wants us to know that she has messily masterminded her career from the beginning. Have you ever seen a person unqualified to speak on legal affairs make a fool of themselves by doing it anyways? What a bunch of tools am I right? All right, so basically, according to Law and Reddit, when you make music with a label and sign the right contracts, the music becomes two distinct entities subject to ownership. There's the actual composition, lyrics, and style, let's call these the publishing rights. And then there's the actual recordings of the songs and music. Let's call these the masters. When Taylor Swift first began her career, she signed a deal with Big Machine Records, promising to make albums with them for 13 years. They give her the resources and in return, they own the masters on her first six albums. So 13 years later in 2018, that contract expires and Swift wants to purchase her masters, but Big Machine says, sure, if you make six more albums for us. So she says nah in legal terms and signs a record deal with Universal instead. Now the masters are up for grabs and one day some private equity weirdos buy out Big Machine Records. Somehow Swift's masters land in the hands of a dude. Which brings us to Scooter Braun. Ugh. So now a dude named Scooter Braun has the rights to Taylor Swift's masters and she low-key hates him. I couldn't believe who he sold it to because we've had endless conversations about Scooter Braun and he has 300 million reasons to conveniently forget those conversations. Well, you know what they say, if you can't beat them, re-record your masters to retain the rights to your artistic output, and she did. For the past couple years, Taylor Swift has been re-recording her output from 2006 to 2017 and it has been met with monumental success. Not only has it shaken norms within the industry, but Swift's impressive output 
reaffirms her constant position in the culture as culture. After a decade of output, listening to Taylor Swift in 2023 is a unique experience. Stop the cope. Be honest, there's something about it. Beyond the music, you're also listening to a part of her life, a part of a grander personal lore that she's been building for years. Her life is literally a part of the artistic experience. And I know that sounds silly, like of course, artists express pieces of their life in their work, but Swift provides an unprecedented, in fact, a signature amount of detail about her life in her work. She was born to be a brand. From the social media engagement, to the having fans come to her house, to the personal lyrics. It was crazy how many people were coming up to me and mentioning the songs that were the most personal on the record and saying that those were the ones they could relate to the most. At that point, I started to realize that it was a a good thing to put details into songs. She has sacrificed her soul to the public as if she's some kind of capitalist Jesus figure for the music industry and for the culture beyond the usual persona or image crafting we expect of celebrities. Just continue to be an open book and continue to be open to being hurt and being humiliated and let down and feeling feeling all these things that I need to feel in order to write songs. To the point where for her, emotion isn't just something to be experienced, but something to consciously monitor for inspiration. And it works. The songs become tinged with her personal history, like the experience of listening to Reputation is inseparable from the personal drama surrounding it. Listening to the 2021 Taylor's version of All Too Well is a 10 minute experience inseparable from The Scarf and The Guy and Taylor Swift herself. I used to think that if you leave out details that people could relate more. But I, I don't think that's the case because I think that it's really the more you let people in, the more they feel let in. But there's something even bigger than just the personal. She has managed to not only make herself the artistic experience, but her unique dominance in culture has made it so that the cultural landscape that she helped build through her career has similarly become a part of the artistic experience. From the beginning, she meticulously and successfully planned her eras and reinventions to follow shifts in culture in a way that would position her to become the voice of a generation. She was the image of culturally sanctioned teen purity that made it acceptable for a generation of young girls to love her. She was the epitome of 2014 pop feminism. She grew with her fans and gave them an intimate place through which to escape during the pandemic. And listen, I get the optics. How dare I prop up the favorite white cisgender heterosexual girl of the moment. But I'm not propping her up exactly. Don't get me wrong, she's a genius at the culture industry, but to be a genius in the culture industry is to know how to negotiate with a system built from hegemony, oppression, patriarchy, violence, racism, all the poopisms we've discussed so far in this video. Sure, she's challenged the institution, but all in the effort to become the new face of musical hegemony. To be the epitome of a cultural moment is not necessarily to be the most valorable of that moment. She epitomizes parts of contemporary culture that are kind of, in a word, f***ed. Social media taking over our lives, white feminism, neoliberalism, pee, poop, it's all a video essayist dream. Taylor Swift represents how, in the 21st century, art is no longer just a representation of life and culture. It is no longer an expression of life and culture. Instead, a real individual's life, like a real person, has become art. Taylor Swift is art. Since I was 15 years old, if people criticized me for something, I changed it. So you realize you might be this amalgamation of criticisms that were hurled at you and not an actual person who's made any of these choices themselves. We make ourselves out of cultural material, living our lives in third person in complete self-aware ironic detachment from the present. Then the other part, the culture, is also a part of the art. And there's precedent for this. Returning to our friends the Beatles, they released their album Sgt. Pepper in 1967 and the album became the soundtrack for the summer of love and boomer hopes and dreams. The album became inseparable from that cultural moment of hippies believing in peace, love, and drugs. The cultural experience 
is a part of the experience of the art. Generation-defining artists, for better or worse, become associated with cultural moments and waves that become inseparable from the moments and ears they first reach forever changing the way we listen to that type of music. And though academic media analysis helps us understand how culture has always been a part of art, I think Swift is somewhat unique in this respect. When she drops an album, she makes a deliberate effort to make each album's promotional period into what she calls an era, hence the era's tour. Each era is a distinct aesthetic production that penetrates all parts of her cultural production in that moment. She literally brands pieces of time into coherent pieces of cultural materials that become massively popular. It's important to kind of have a vision for what you want uh, your look to be for, for, in my case, for an album. Like, I want people to identify with the 1989 album of being like, when I cut my hair, when I started wearing, like, you know, crop tops and short shorts or whatever. I want there to be a visual that comes to their mind because I want it to impact them emotionally, lyrically, mm -hmm. visually, all of those things. Multisensory. Are... Like, folklore isn't just a good album, it's also the folklore era, with curated aesthetics of sad cottagecore lesbians writing poetry on a candlelit wood floor obscured by cardigans. She wants you to form an emotional connection to her personal evolution by managing every aspect of your cultural sensory experience. Where I think Taylor Swift diverges is in the ways that she's managed to combine cultural defining moments with her personal narrative. For example, her white pop feminism isn't just the epitome of mid to late 2000s awakenings. In the documentary Miss Americana, it's also a part of her own real and honest experiences facing the violence of a patriarchal system. And that's important. The presentation of her narrative might be planned and calculated, but it's all built from real experience, real cultural feelings, real generational moods. The combination of culture and personal experience brews into a one-of-a-kind artistic experience. To experience Taylor Swift is to watch a millennial woman's life unfold in deliberate parallel to our own cultural lives. Like, I couldn't tell you whether or not I genuinely enjoy the song Shake It Off. I don't think I really cared for it when it first came out in 2014, but then it started to play on the radio over and over, and 14-year-old me was like, huh, this is perfectly adequate. And you know that phenomenon when you start hearing a song a lot, and if it's a good enough song, you're conditioned to like it through the sheer force of repetition? I think something like that happened. I think. I'm not sure because now I'm 23. It's been almost 10 years of hearing Shake It Off in random places. It was the soundtrack of my freshman year of high school. My friend did it once at karaoke. I've definitely heard it in a Target. I think they played it in an arena at a sporting event I was at. And after nine years of this, I don't know if I like it. It's like asking me if I like the song Happy Birthday. Like, no, yes, I don't know, it's happy birthday. I don't even engage with it as if it's art anymore. It's just a part of life, a part of me. But it's not just a song that's become a part of me, it's Taylor Swift herself that's become a part of me. Here's a bit of what people from my focus group said. The songs aren't just about a sound. They're like emotions too, like, especially when it comes to sadness. There are so many Taylor Swift songs that I can go back and listen to or that I don't listen to because they take me back to super specific moments in my life. If you know Taylor Swift, chances are you've known Taylor Swift for a very, very long time. You may have like drifted away from it, but you will always kind of have those core memories of those nostalgic memories with this artist. I would listen to a song and I remember how I listened to it back when I lived in that place or back when everything was simple or seemed more simpler, I guess. So, I said that I don't know Taylor Swift, but really, I can't be sure, because I do know how she takes her coffee. She drinks a grande non-fat caramel latte. Starbucks added the drink to their menu in 2021 to commemorate the re-release of Red. I think that as far as songwriting goes, I've been essentially opening up my diary for the world to read since I was 
16. So that's an interesting kind of vulnerability to have when you are telling your life story and revealing your life narrative and all the feelings you had about those things happening to you to people who are gonna understand it and see your side of it and kind of see, um, look at what you're saying and say, I get that, I feel that too. But you're also revealing your life and your true emotions to people who just kind of want to take you down and make fun of you. How do we read Taylor Swift's art? If her art intersects with culture and identity in new ways, then we have to tear it to shreds, right? I mean, that's what a good video essayist does, right? I tell you why you should feel bad about everything you love until you realize your identity is constituted by commodities and then you follow me on Twitter. I'm sorry, Marx, but this whole ruthless criticism of everything existing takes a toll on the psyche. But then Freud told me that the psyche is driven by the unconscious, so does that mean I have to ruthlessly critique myself? I mean, I'm just trying to become a good person, man. But then Nietzsche said that goodness is a cultural construct, so am I just trying to fulfill the legacy of a certain culture? Oh, man. According to French philosopher Paul Rick... Wait, what the? An O and an E? I didn't know the French were bisexual about their vowels, too. Pick a side, pansy. According to this guy... The theorists Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche share a general attitude and spirit. All three of them write about how people take a lot of things for granted and that they shouldn't take those things for granted. Marx said that a capitalist society requires a capitalist ideology that masks the reality of economic exploitation. Freud said that our conscious thoughts and actions are driven by mysterious motherfucking unconscious forces. Nietzsche said that truth is a freaking illusion. So, Mr. Bisexual Vowels observed their similarities and called their shared spirit the hermeneutics of suspicion. Well, if hermeneutics is just a fancy word for interpretation, then that means all three thinkers fundamentally want to interpret the lies and illusions of consciousness. All right, fast forward to 2003. Taylor Swift is hawking her demo up and down Asheville, and Eve Sedgwick publishes an incredibly important book called Touching Feeling. At this point in the academic humanities and social sciences, our old friends Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche are the big three philosopher guys with the most influence over sociological theory and social philosophy. They're all deeply influenced in some way by the big three, and they're all doing the analysis that the bisexual French guy called the hermeneutics of suspicion. Essentially, social sciences and humanities people loved to be suspicious about big systems, as they should be, and they call it critique. Critique this, critique that, that thing is ideology, that thing is creating a false desire, that thing over there is a cultural construct. For the past like 100 years, everyone's been doing the critique game. Eve Sedgwick, the aforementioned touch and feeler, calls this critical type of social and cultural analyses paranoid reading. Critique uses an interpretive framework of suspicion and paranoia. And that's well and good. It's important to critique institutions built on the oppression of marginalized people. But Eve Sedgwick proposes that maybe paranoid readings shouldn't be the only tools in our toolkit. Maybe we shouldn't be in a state of constant paranoia, suspicion, and negative orientation. It's strange because this paranoid orientation towards the world, this paranoia that fueled the compelling critiques of society and Marxism, it's a similar paranoia to the one that fuels conspiracy theories and social distrust. Our world is a paranoid world, and I totally get it, there's a lot of sus things out there. But also, there needs to be room for something else other than critical suspicion, right? I can't always be suspicious and critical of the art that I love, and if what I'm saying is true, if Taylor Swift's art and persona has become a part of ourselves, then in critiquing her, am I critiquing myself? Am I simply outlining the ways that I'm a capitalist commodity, thrown like meat to the lions of a digital coliseum? I'm sure there's some truth to that, but there has to be other tools, 
other orientations, some kind of way out. Eve Cedric writes that critical paranoid readings always try to anticipate the future. Paranoid readings want to avoid surprises. Ha ha ha, you can't get me capitalism, I know your dirty tricks. I know your next move, culture industry. Paranoid readings want to avoid the pain of surprise. They want to anticipate the institutions that sustain oppression. They want to be one step ahead of domination. But there are different ways to read culture that aren't paranoid. Sedgwick offers the alternative concept of reparative readings. It's a form of reading that queer people and communities have historically used. Reparative readings engage with a text in a way that adds to the text's meaning. It engages with text or media in a way that is affirmative, creative, and caring. It reclaims. Reparative readings don't try to avoid surprises as paranoid readings do. They embrace the fact of uncertainty and reformulate it into new possibilities. Because there can be terrible surprises, however, there also can be good ones. Hope, often a fracturing, even a traumatic thing to experience, is among the energies by which the reparatively positioned reader tries to organize the fragments in part objects she encounters and creates. Because the reader has room to realize that the future may be different from the present, it is also possible for her to entertain such profoundly painful, profoundly relieving, ethically crucial possibilities as that the past, in turn, could have happened differently from the way it actually did. Reparative readings do not deny institutional oppression, and often critical, more paranoid readings must exist alongside reparative readings. But critical readings alone don't offer marginalized people an alternative way of living. If all we do is criticize and negatively analyze, we might successfully deconstruct an institution, but it might leave us with nowhere to go. Reparative readings offer an alternative to the hostile institutions that exist in everyday life, where paranoid readings don't. What we can best learn from such reparative practices are, perhaps, the many ways selves and communities succeed in extracting sustenance from the objects of a culture, even of a culture whose avowed desire has often been to not sustain them. For example, you could analyze queer phenomena, like drag through a paranoid lens, as Judith Butler does in Gender Trouble, and characterize drag as a radical project that exposes the constructive and performative nature of all gendered acts. That's an incredible insight, but you could also analyze drag through a reparative lens, viewing it as a beautiful and joyous creative gendered practice, a camp mode of survival in a world that is otherwise hostile to disruption. Queer people have been doing this for decades in a variety of forms. We've been staunch critics, but we've also been pioneers of joy, reclamation, and affirmation. And isn't that kind of what we need in a paranoid world? Care, understanding, affirmation. I just spent the last few months of my life analyzing all the ways Taylor Swift is secretly upholding racialized hierarchy, capitalism, and cultural hegemony. And yeah, of course she is. She's a goddamn billionaire pop star. You don't amass that amount of capital without some tainted bills. But to the queer person who listened to her music during a breakup, to the queer person who learned to love their identity through her songwriting, to the queer person who had their first kiss as You Belong With Me played on the radio. Who is she? When I conducted focus groups with my audience, my, you know, predominantly queer audience, I was surprised how easily queer people used reparative readings to affirm parts of their lives through Taylor Swift. I was breaking up with my girlfriend and like Taylor failed the moment. Like, even with this song like that, it's absolutely not connecting to, like, queer love, whatever. Like, the song for me was Better Man, and it's, like, literally not about that. But, like, the, the way she captured the feeling that she felt in that moment, in that relationship, it was like, oh, that, I get that. Yeah, I can also just add, being a queer person in my country, it was really, you know, it wasn't prohibited but it was really anti-queer like loving general was this big club that i was never going to be invited to and when i found taylor it was like the only way to have this to imagine this and to really feel it even though i never had like a partner or whatnot even though i didn't relate to the songs on the personal level i still felt like they spoke to me 
She's a heterosexual white woman from a pretty privileged socioeconomic background, and yet somehow, fans all over the world of different backgrounds can connect to her music in a way that transcends words. I think what was mostly positive for me from this conversation is seeing so many queer people still resonate with her. It's like, I'm not crazy, so it makes sense that you know it meant something to me and it meant something to you as well. I think Taylor is kind of, uh, her music is kind of intricately linked with my understanding, like my, my kind of journey of understanding my queerness. It's kind of like a, a gateway into a more, um, hmm, like a more openly affirming music and artists. Uh, and like, you know, growing up in a small, conservative, very heteronormative town, Taylor was acceptable enough within the mainstream to like, to kind of move into a more progressive space. Even if we don't know Taylor Swift, the person, there are infinite ways to know her. You can know the headline, you can know the criticisms, you can know the theories, the lyrics, the list of exes. You can know her as the soundtrack to your rainy afternoon. You can know her as a ruthless capitalist. You can know her as the woman who saved your life. But now that you know, what will you do? Thank you very much to my patrons who make this possible. Six Slugs Aaron Seiler Adeline Grubb Adrian Radley Eris Arlecchino Aiden Lisandro All Pizzas Are Personal Amanda S Amy Gleixner Anna Atti Please Avery Barbie V Beatrice Dahl Brad the Great Brandon Uzumaki Campbell Cat Boy Girl, Cat Lady Isabel, Kaylin S, Charles Harrow, Charlie Rose, Cheese Boy, Chester Snap, Cobalt Pink, Colin Coltrera, Kimmy Giggler, Cooper, Cosmo Billing, Dane Much, Danny Chalice, Don Hopkins, Drainix, Dropout Ninja, Diane, Elena Amesqua, Elizabeth Morgan, Ellie Nar. Emma Anastasi, Eric J. Moffitt, Esper Lady, Fat Kirk, Fickle Harpy, Florencia Rodriguez, Fuzzy Numbers, Gabriella Day, Gali, Georgie, Gray Rainier, Hannah O, Hannah Chua, Heather Phraseschild, Hida, Hal the Magician, ENT Gray. If being gay is a phase, then the moon is definitely a lesbian. Inna for Inanna. Iris, Irritated Nick, Isabella Figueda, Jack, Jacob Palmer, Jade Persuades, Janin, Jess Emsley, Jiminy's Journal, Joxon S. Costello, Julie Werner, Justin Chapman, Just Some Sentient Matter, Kay, Kenzie Woodbridge, Knights Who Say Sledge, Levi Margolis, Lex Reckless, Lynn Shi, Linz, Liz Hirschman, Lucia Garcia, Malpertuis, Manway, Matthew Mercer, Megalomaniac64, Megan, Mel, Mary, Michael Gelaspi, Moye, Mysterious DG, Nicholas Bloom, Nyfan, Oyster Philosophy, Paige, Paul, Paul O'Toole, Played Too Much, Rain and Chaos, Wren, Richard Knight, Rosa Mori of the Sea, RSS, Ryan Howard, SH, Sam Gersel, Sarah Parker Schemelt, Shannon Hutchinson, Sidekick, Solborg Birgistotir, Tanner Clark, Taylor White, The Bestie Pepsi Boys, Tiff Rodriguez, Tim Rajevsky, Timo, Tony Whitson, Uardito, Umaima Beige, Valued Customer, Wainoa, Whatever It Is, Ren Martin. <laughs>